Hey everybody, welcome back. I am Emily Moyer, Danny Katz is with me. We were supposed to have a guest today. This is a guest we've been supposed to have before, but interesting things seem to keep happening to prevent our getting together, which means there will be massive revelations when we finally do. So we wish him well and uh, that everything turns out okay for him, but we decided just to roll with it anyway today and do just kind of a short show. Um, you got an extra show last week because David was with us, David Martin. And um, we're gonna, yeah, so it's a little extra bonus of the two of us. Who can ever get enough of the two of us? Danny, hey, <laughs> I think we're on number 35. Words number 35. There we are. Wow, is middle just... age. <laughs> up. Is 35 middle age? No, that person would only live to be 70. I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing anyway, middle age, as though we know that we get to have the exact same amount of years that we've already lived. Yeah, it's weird. Everything's weird. <laughs> That's it is. Everything is weird. So because our regular show is not happening, the one that show that we had kind of planned is not happening, we're just going to sort of pop around about some stuff that's sort of been on your plate. I only have a few things because I sort of wasn't uh, focused on gathering together a bunch of little tidbits and thoughts, but we'll just start talking and see what happens. Oftentimes when we think nothing is going to happen, then we have like a very lengthy show. So Right now, the plan is a kind of short show today and, and maybe something else back next week when our, or maybe he's probably going to be a little longer, whatever it is, it'll be what it'll be. And here we go. So Kanye. Kanye. Okay. So I feel like before we start with Kanye, we have to start with Joe Rogan's very serious announcement by way of a different face saying that, right? Because he didn't look like himself at all. And he, he put up this very serious Instagram video saying, well, Jamie has COVID, so we can't do any more podcasts indefinitely because we have to wait until he has tested clean three times. Um, and then the whole comment stream was just like- think It has to be, we've all tested, we, it, we all have to wait 10 days and three clean tests or something like that. 10 days and three clean tests, so no more shows at all indefinitely. And then the comment stream was just awash with, so the Illuminati won't let you interview Kanye, so the deep state doesn't want you talking to Alex. Like everyone was just knew exactly what it was. No one bought it for two seconds. Yeah. Okay. So here are my thoughts. I saw that little announcement that you sent to me on, on Instagram kind of thing. So, okay. Couple of things. So he looked really weird. So I don't know if just he's been wearing makeup on his own podcast that we're unaware of. And so it's like, it, not look like him at all. It was really weird. Like it, it was like, he looked like a cartoon character of him, like an aged cartoon character. It was really weird. And I think what I heard him say was that shows are canceled and definitely right now we may do some um, video ones which i think he did end up doing one that was matthew mcconaughey and matthew mcconaughey lives in austin at least part-time so that wasn't in person with matthew mcconaughey yeah, that looked like it was on zoom or skype or something like that to me and then it seems to go back to um in in, in person interviews so here are my sort of immediate thoughts um it was an intelligence communication this idea that 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 someone had 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 covid was some kind of thing like we're hitting pause on something or we're switching directions with the way we're going with this. And then the next thing you told me sort of gave me the indication and you told me that you've been listening to the No Agenda podcast, which is Adam Curry's podcast. And that Adam Curry said on there that he was going to go on Joe Rogan again to do a repeat because Joe Rogan felt like the problem with the show was that they weren't wearing headphones. Okay, so let just just to be super accurate. Okay. He said that Joe Rogan called him and asked to do a do-over because he felt like him, he wasn't himself in that interview and that was because of the headphones. To which Adam Curry said, that makes total sense. Right. Now that to me, because Adam Curry is so wackadoodle about sound, he always has been. Like since I, when I first started listening to him back 10 years ago, he was always like, if the sound wasn't perfect, he didn't want to start the show. Like, and he'd ask John C. Dvorak many times and say, he's obsessed with sound. He also has a hearing issue that he has some very high tech hearing aid that makes his sound even better than his hearing more precise than most people. So he's, for whatever reasons, I'm not also just, there's lots of other stuff going on, but he is particularly concerned about sound. So that would sound reasonable to someone like him for someone to say something like that. Uh, let's just pull out any like, Tom wait a minute, but wait, hold up. How does that sound reasonable? There were no sound quality issues on the show. Joe wasn't referencing. Joe was saying that that was why he dropped the ball and act like a drunk monkey moron. 
Right, because uh, I will say this, just partly from knowing like um, so many DJs from being in the dance music scene, if they're used to a certain set of headphones, say, and then they forget theirs at home or something goes wrong with one of theirs and they have to wear someone else's, or like if they are somewhere just playing for fun, like at a friend's after hours, and they don't have their headphones, so they're playing without it, like they feel like they do not have like the level of perception that they normally have. Now, okay, that makes sense for a DJ because a DJ isn't using intellectual brain capacity to form sentences and analyze. It's not an, an exchange. All they're doing is right. hearing sound and delivering sound. Well, it's finish. not a conversation. Let me finish what I what I'm saying. So Joe is used to wearing them, right? Like I don't, so what, Laura always like wants to know why I insist on wearing my hair back all the time. It's because I can't concentrate if my hair is not back. I'm not used to the feeling of having it hair bugs back. you. You like do but, this. So Joe over here, he's been wearing headphones for years and that's how he is used to feeling when he is do I'm, I'm first presenting the part of this that is logical and then we'll get to the illogical part because that far outweighs the logical part. But Joe is used to having that on, that there, right? And if you notice, like over the years, he's a lot of times told people, pull your microphone closer, readjust this. He also does seem to be um, a little bit fixated on that kind of stuff. And that could be a personal obsession or it could be a, can be something that's like a distraction from a different issue. Like my dad sometimes, like when we're in a deep conversation, he'll like be like, move that glass over there. You're gonna hit it. The glass could be like five feet away from where I am. And he thinks that my flailing arms, which are long, but not five feet long, are somehow gonna knock a glass over on a table five feet away. And it's a distraction from not being able to either handle the intensity of the conversation or not wanting to address the thing that I just said or whatever, or wanting to have like a change in the, pace or the shift of the conversation. So it is something that I've observed in conversations with people before. So those could be some kind of rational part of it, but the rest is completely irrational, right? But the reason that, so, so, so those are the parts that are gonna speak to like the like weird idiosyncrasies of these two mates. My thoughts immediately were, Joe is used to being cued, right? Or he gets, uh, maybe Joe, Joe is used to being cued, right? And, 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 um, you know, uh, was Adam wearing head headphones during the thing? No, he wasn't either. So maybe they both want, I, who the fuck knows, right? But like, basically, you know, it was, um, uh, okay, a lot of things. So I think that's weird. I think maybe Joe is more wired up than we think he is in terms of like, you know, being fed ideas or lines or things to talk about, stop, don't go any farther, distract. You know, I don't think that they're they're providing content for him, right? But I think, I think that's that's the piece. I'm sorry to interrupt, but just before you move away from it, that does make sense as far as Joe is used to taking cues from his handlers through his ears. And maybe because he didn't have that, he was too heavy handed mm -hmm. and too obvious well, yeah. in how he was doing it on his own with Adam. Yeah. And and also he was drinking. And so people, you know what I mean? Things get messy and, and whatnot. As far as this COVID thing, like one of the things he did say is like, maybe we'll get back to doing video interviews or maybe we'll have some in studio with a different producer for a little bit, right? Which he really didn't want to do, which was sweet. His, lo his loyalty to the fake COVID Jamie story was cute. But then those in-person interviews came quicker than the 10 days, three extra tests, all that kind of stuff. No, yeah. Kanye was already on the books before he, Kanye and Alex Jones right. were but, on the books before he announced that they were canceled. Right, but they hadn't been recorded. At least we believe they hadn't been recorded, right? Correct. So it's, it's possible that they had already recorded the Kanye and they didn't say so, right? But interviews, in-person interviews started before that supposed 10 days had passed, right? Which tells me, and with no, I didn't watch the shows, so I don't know if there was interaction with Jamie. No, none. Okay. So there was likely another producer, and maybe this whole point was they wanted a new producer in there, not permanently, because people are used to Jamie, and he'd have to concoct a huge story to explain Jamie being gone, although I think Jamie is also a controller and a handler of sorts, right, because Jamie is incredibly anti-conspiracy theory, right, and, and Jamie's had a, a, done a strange selection of materi uh, media appearances himself. Like, he's been on the Glenn Beck show, and he's yeah, been a weird combination of, of things, right? Um, so maybe there was a different producer for those spots to sort of implement what the formula is going to be, or sort of like 
teeter, like, like they realized things were going in a bad direction and things were becoming captain obvious. So they needed something to steady the ship, right? Mm -hmm. He then proceeded with huge shows, right? Now, Maynard and, um, Maynard and Kanye both, uh, not Kanye, Maynard and Matthew McConaughey are both Austin locals. They both live okay. in Austin. Um, Kanye obviously does not. There was an African-American gentleman and another gentleman who I'm not familiar with, who I don't know necessarily where they're from, but yeah, so he did several shows. Maybe some of those had been in the can before, maybe not. Um, and, and maybe there was a different producer in there to sort of like just balance the ship because things had been a little full off steady, right? And he seems to, things seems to have balanced a little, but of course the show that we didn't get was Alex Jones, right? And so that's interesting. And it could be that oh, they, they like this controversy also about the not Alex Jones, or it could be that they wanted to avoid Alex Jones. Both, both, both would be intelligence, you know, like purposes and whatnot. So I think there's a lot of stuff going on there. I've only watched clips since that happened. I haven't watched any whole shows. I've seen some stuff and I'm like, yeah, that's reasonable and some stuff that I'm like, yeah, that's nonsense, you know? So um, it's hard to say, but I'll say this, right? Like the, um, what I see as the overall thing happening is that there is a battle, probably multiple battles for like the controlling, um, what do they call it when controlling share in the direction that Joe Rogan is going. So he had like a certain group of handlers for quite a while in Los Angeles, right? And he relocated and there's probably now like new groups or like sort of vying for like the being the controlling aspect of where this goes, but not, but, no, but they don't have it completely. And so I think there is a faction here that involves like the Adam Curry kind of thing. And I think that that could be like a co-mingled, like, like I think that this weird thing we were watching of like who was kind of controlling who is part of the sort of like illusion of some of it, right? To, to a certain extent, or maybe they're both sort of being controlled by a further back entity, but each of them thinks that they're controlled. Like this is how crazy some of this shit gets, right? You know, um, but the, 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 that whole thing was very weird. Um, and also like, obviously it makes perfect sense that when you relocate to a new city, if there are interesting people in that city, you start with doing a lot of them, that makes sense. But I think they're really having a trial run of who his like regular locals are gonna be. Like here in LA, he had Joey Diaz and Brian Cat, all the, like he had, a, he had people who were consistently um, part of the show that were LA locals, Duncan and da, 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 whatever, right? So I think they're looking for who that team is gonna be there because whether or not the people who are part of the regulars are controlled on their own or not is not the issue. Like, just like we all do this. We have regulars, I have regulars on my show and then other people who I just do one-offs with and whatever. They're trying to figure out like what the cast of characters are gonna be so then they can figure out where they're gonna insert their things of control, right? Like one right. thing that I had figured out, and this doesn't have so much to do with the locals, but like oftentimes like Joe would have Abby Martin on, which I disagree with her about a lot of stuff, but she was like really the only one who was like questioning of Israel and more pro-Palestine who would ever come on his show, right? And she would say things, very controversial things about people who he liked, right? And then within just usually a few weeks after she had been on, the CIA agent guy would come on and say, and sort of redirect some of that sort of underhandedly, not in an obvious way, it felt like to me. Or, right, so, or, or they'd have, you know, that kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying that like all of that is designed and intentional, but that was a pattern I had started to notice, right? Mm -hmm. And so like I, some of that stuff may happen with Adam. Like it may be that like things go a certain way for a bit on the show. And then when they need to be circled back or, sh or shaken up or sent in a different direction again, that's like when Adam comes in and does a little of that stuff that looks like he's being a little bit like, um, uh, um, oppositional or a little bit, um, or, or that it's just like a bros hanging and uh, right. But it also like creates a shakeup that then sends it in some other kind of way. So I don't know. I mean, we're like, I don't really know. It's harder and harder for me to watch any at length. I pop in on some of the clips. A lot of times I don't finish the clips anymore. Um, I was alarmed at the clip that I saw that included Kanye. I haven't watched the whole show yet. So we'll only talk about the Kanye thing a little bit because you're wanting me to watch the whole thing because you think there's interesting stuff there. But the dramatic and uncomfortable pauses in between his, not only the, Joe's question and the answer, but like 
Kanye would say a sentence or half a sentence and then stop for sometimes almost a minute before he finished, like was really odd to me. And then also Jeff pointed it out to me and I, and I, I, I had noticed it, but I was so taken aback by the pauses that I didn't focus on this. The looking down almost as if there was like a teleprompter screen on the floor of the uh, little red communist capsule or something like that. Like now, some that I guess that could be a form of concentration or trying to put together your thoughts, but it was odd. It was odd. And I was so alarmed by it that like, I didn't even watch any more clips. I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Right. And, um, okay. So can I speak to that before we get just too far away from all the things that you've mentioned? Um, because you sent me the, I, I it's, don't watch Joe anymore. It's, it's hard for me to stomach the programming that comes through. So generally, as soon as I hear him, you know, with one of his like pro pharma things or anti-conspiracy things or whatever, like I turn him off. So you sent me that clip and I mean, PS, he's doing it in person. So he clearly hasn't gotten three clean COVID tests. Right. We just need to acknowledge that. It's been less than a week since he made the announcement and Kanye was in the studio, clearly flew in. I don't know, maybe he ran there, maybe he drove there, whatever, but like they were in person. So I saw the clip you sent me and I completely agreed. And we talked about, okay, this is why he's back on the headphones because Kanye is clearly being fed the information. And then I got frustrated with myself after I watched the whole thing and just seeing how every single, I mean, the media, I don't wanna just hone in on Trump, but like any sort of clip taken out of context can make anyone look any way the media wants to make them look. And that clip, was completely not indicative of the whole three hour conversation. And, and I can see why you and Jeff would draw those conclusions. It made perfect sense having only seen that clip. Yeah. But in the context of the whole interview, I got a completely different impression. So because I saw that, that clip, I was watching the interview through a certain lens of like, okay, Kanye's controlled. Like, where can I find these catches? And so that's how I was watching it because he's a wild man. You know, he's just going on on these very long tangents that he calls symphonies. And Joe is just kind of letting him run. I mean, I actually think Joe did a really good job of it, but he speaks for the, in the, you know, he's going from like topic to topic to tendril off to this offshoot and here and there. And, and then Joe's, Basically for the first two hours, Joe was just kind of like trying to make him feel safe and let him know like, I know everyone else thinks you're crazy, but I don't, I just think you're smart. Like kind of a kiss assy thing. But so the pieces that I caught were one, he said that he thinks Twitter is the most, is the least censored social media platform. Mm -hmm. And this interview was done in the past couple of days. So I'm like, okay, control, right? because that was the lens through which I was watching it. And then he had two mentions of Kodak. And, I'm st and I had noticed some other videos that I saw last week, I I'm noticing how Kodak is slipping in and that we need to be excited about Kodak. And I had sent you the tour says, um, where she did a whole show about Kodak and how Kodak, which is known for printing, but now they're in the pharmaceutical business and what? they've been given Oh yeah. So that was part of, so this is something that I, I, I'm encouraging us to get deeper into as we go down the rabbit hole. So Kodak got all this money from the government to start making our pharmaceuticals as part of the Trump administration's let's bring manufacturing back to the States. Mm -hmm. So it kind of seems like a good thing, except their printing company, they're not a pharmaceutical company. Oh, that and makes sense to me. That, I'll tell you why that makes, it, that doesn't make, um, sense in a way that we would like, but it makes sense logically based on what I know. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, so super kindergarten overview is that they're really good at 3D printing. So if there's 3D printing organs or 3D yes. printing things and how a big part of this fake pandemic and pushing everyone to be tested is to collect their DNA. So they're creating this huge DNA database that Kodak has access to. So Oh, lo and behold, George Soros needs a new kidney. And wow, someone in the database is a perfect match. And they're driving a Tesla. And oh, they just got into a car accident and died. And now their kidney is available. Like, yeah. just kind of tying into that whole thing. Okay. So, 
Okay, go ahead. Then no, no, go ahead. Okay, so um, if I'm gonna have to find some information that is separate from Tor uh, <laughs> to, before I'm willing to consider that this in any other way than I normally like just play with information in my head, right? Um, but uh, uh, so if you listen like long back into like Sophia Smallstorm's like stuff, she's constantly talked about how the plan was to use our bodies as 3D printers, right? And so that would make sense to me on that account that the idea is really like not totally what you're saying is possible, but like I think the greater thing is that they want to like, if, even if you're 3D printing an organ, it's actually better to do it inside a human body, just like they try and regrow human organs inside of pigs, pigs and things like that. So you have that sort of environment of like the inside of the body kind of stuff like that, right? And so like, but I, like if you can actually generate it from inside a body as opposed to generating it outside and then putting it in the body to sort of grow or to heart, heart, whatever, right? So Sophia used to talk about a lot and about being like little bits of technology that's organized themselves and sort of come together inside the body. But she's also talked about putting together machines that will then 3D print stuff. And this was really in relation to a lot of odd things related to Morgellons when people were producing like weird, like bugs and feathers and shit like that out of their body. Like, where are these coming from? People aren't swallowing feathers, like, you know, kind of thing. And even, that isn't how it works. If you swallow a feather, it doesn't come out of your skin, right? So like these seem to be, and some of these had almost like, when you look at, just like when you look at some of these modern day, quote unquote, mosquitoes and shit, they look like little drones or little technologies. That's what some of these things that people were finding inside their bodies looked like. And so she was, you know, making the leap based on evidence, right? So that makes sense to me because they're in printing. But the other thing is, remember years ago, they would talk about swallowing capsule, capsules that had a little camera in them that would go through and look at the inside of your organs when they were trying to decide if you were a candidate for certain therapies or whatnot. So I think that is a, is a large part of it as well. So I've talked to, like, I've talked to people both from that, like worried about surveillance from a health perspective, but even back, like when I used, like was hanging around lots of people that did drugs, like I have literally heard from people like, like, and what this is what was always crazy to me is how is the crazy shit that I heard from people who are on drugs also the things that I hear from some of these most brilliant people who an analyze surveillance and also people who are like think that they're target individuals but have never done drugs, right? And this, the, the connecting thing might be that like, smart dust is available everywhere and they experimented first on drug communities and then they moved out into other groups, right? But people would say stuff like, I was looking at myself in the mirror and I saw a camera flash from inside of my body, my skin or my eyes or something like that, right? So if they're able to have really, really tiny, tiny cameras, really, really tiny, tiny like printing units and things like that, I mean, this sounds insane, but this is where we're at, right? That where, you know, everything has been reduced down to really tiny size and things that we would only have ever thought of as technologies and processes that existed outside the body are now swimming around inside of us, you know, outside of our, you know, awareness or consent. Um, so that makes sense to me about Kodak on a certain level. Um, but even like, I'd have to go and do like some deep research on Kodak, but a lot of these like camera, um, video kind of companies, they have a lot of patents on prismatic technologies with light spectrum things and stuff like that. So I think we could be getting into even weirder territory than our normal brain allows us to immediately think of when we think of Kodak. When you look at some of the symbols of some of these companies, like Polaroid has like the spec color spectrum, right? Right. And Polaroid has been an interesting thing over time, right? Because that was a unique style of picture taking, you know, kind of thing. So when you look at some of the symbology and some of the patents of these companies, um, there's a much more ancient, much more metaphysical thing going on with some of them. Um, so uh, I think that the, um, the sky's the limit on the possibilities as to why Kodak could be having a new level of importance in a variety of ways. Right, and I think, I, I mean, I still encourage you to get over the tour thing and I also respect where you're at. So do whatever research is necessary. In this video, she, which I posted in my Telegram group, if anyone wants to see it, she talks about how some of the technology is non-local. It talks about teleportation. So like if Kodak is printing your medicine mm -hmm. and they have, they're tra and they have your DNA on file and they track, oh, well, they have the dormant 
genetics for XYZ, that, that Kodak has the technology to turn on something in the pharmaceuticals it's printing for you to bring on a heart attack, to bring on an embolism, to bring on an aneurysm, to make you sick. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense to me. And just by the way, just because I have an, uh, uh, sort of intuitive disdain for her doesn't mean that she isn't right about many or even most of the things she says, right? Like if, if she's a disinformation person, the disinformation occurs in just a small percentage of the material. So I'm working really hard at separating content from character in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. So I, I you know, I, I listen to it, but for me to go and like make a theory based on it, I would just have to also find it somewhere else besides just her. Totally. And the reason it came up, which you and I were talking about before we hopped on was that I keep, whatever media I was listening to last week, I just kept hearing people talking about Kodak, Kodak, Kodak. And then when I heard Kanye say it, I'm like, and I went back and found the tour says video. Um, so, okay, so getting back to Kanye, on this end of having watched all three hours, I actually don't think he's controlled. And I actually don't think he's controllable. I think there's some areas where, because he's super famous, where he might be sheltered and just not know what he's talking about. Um, and the last part of the deal of getting him on was to get him to say that about Twitter and to get him to say a couple other things. But what I thought was really interesting, and he really won me over by the end, but that Joe let him speak in these long 20, 25 minute rants and Joe would just sit there quietly. And then when he was talking about, you know, at the Joe started to press him because he's pushing to be president right now, not 2024, but he's he's pushing for people to write him in right now. Well, because we have an emergency coming, so. I, and, I mean, our, everything's a fucking emergency. Just the fact that people would even consider voting for Biden is an emergency. But um, so he was, Joe pushed him on, on healthcare and uh, Joe was trying not to sound like a socialist. Like I'll give him props. He put some some effort into trying not to sound like a socialist. But Kanye, who actually, when he was talking about stuff, sounded really freaking intelligent and really attuned to a higher vibration. But he said, you know, the aim of capitalist medicine is to keep us. And Joe fucking interrupted him and said, you mean to treat us. And so right then and there, I just saw, it was like, you know how you have those moments where you see your whole life flash before you? So I saw, okay, Joe is working for the pharmaceutical cabal because he interrupted his flow to change that one word. And Kanye said, yeah, to treat us, to keep us in slavery. And then I got, and also to see it, how controllable Kanye is. Mm -hmm. And Kanye took it for a second, but then didn't. So he's not controllable. And then I saw everything that happened in the Adam Curry, where Joe was testing Adam to see how controllable he was. And Adam kept taking the bait and saying, yes, I'm controllable. Yes, I'm controllable. And I just saw, oh, all this is happening in the public sphere. Like Kanye just failed in that moment. And he let them know, no, you can't control me. But it was, it was so clear, like what in Joe, where he would allow Kanye to go off on these long, long tangents for as long as he did, but he felt the need to interrupt, to correct, to defend the pharmaceutical cabal. Okay, so a lot of stuff was just said there. As to like this thing going on publicly, like with the Adam and Joe thing, right? Like I think both things, I think Adam, that what you're saying where he's showing how he can be controlled, I think some of that is him putting it on. Right, like I think it's part of a dance that's happening here. But why is he putting it on? Because he misses being famous, or does he have an end game that's for the good? Or is he just trying to be not so obvious about the fact that he's there to to, to attempt to? He may be just there to control one thing, right? To so disarm the people from thinking about yeah. that, trying to disarm you and I from thinking that, right? Like all this other stuff, he's not there to control all other things, so he'll concede all that other stuff if he gets. You know, and this might be a long-term dance, right? This might not be like a um, like one and done kind of thing, right? So um, as for the Kanye thing that you're saying- um, well, Hold up, hold up. Cause I want to stay with Adam for a little bit. And since it seems like he's not coming on our show like we can talk about it. <laughs> um, it seemed, I feel like there are a few things at play and I saw it in the Kanye show as well, as far as like our collective obsession with fame mm -hmm. is a pathology that has us in this position because all the famous 
movie stars are telling us what to think about politics and we've gotten to that crazy level. And so I see, I'm curious about Adam. I'm like, okay, is he playing the long game? And is he playing along to get in with Joe and to ultimately get some truths in to the collective conscious for the greater good? Or is there a part of him that misses his fame from back in the MTV days and sees this as a way to get back on top? I don't, I don't know, but I'm- well, both. And also, he, like in the 80s, right, essentially what he was largely doing was handling celebrities, right? He's brought into MTV, he's been around the biggest celebrities in the world, right? And we think of it as like, oh, he's there and he's lucky he gets to interview them, right? But like a lot of times, if you're familiar with the way some of this stuff works, like they're there to monitor or to control or what whatnot, right? And in this day and age, those super, like, it's, it's becoming less and less the music stars that are the big celebrities. And Joe Rogan is now the biggest, is the, a big celebrity. He's as famous- but Keep in mind, Joe's been famous and working to maintain his fame since what, 2000s, late 90s? Right. And I, I think there's some sort of addiction to fame and that level of, of attention that we have to acknowledge as far as the people who are driving culture. Ab absolutely, right, absolutely. But. Adam Curry is used to being there and talking to people when they're in the height of their fame. Mm -hmm. That's his role, right? And, and lots of times your news anchors, your newsmen, things like that, they were working for intelligence agencies and they were handling things or transporting information. That's the other thing. It could be about an information transfer of sorts, right? And if, there's a million things that can be going on, right? Like, I, you're right. And, and all those things could be mushed together. And some of it can be genuine and some of it can be a put on and some of it can be because they're doing what they're paid to be there to do. Like, this is like, you know, we're living in this like really weird time where the amount of information of varying types and with variant, various intents is flying through the air, like at a faster ability than anybody's able, able to sort of like reasonably comprehend it or digest it or anything like that. So, and that's part of what is making this, like all of this, crap that's going on possible because it, it, nobody has the time to parse it all out and to really figure it out. It's coming much faster. It's like having 10 baseballs pitched at you at once and trying to hit one of them for a home run. It, it makes it hard. Even though you think, well, you have a one out of 10 chance, that's easier than a one out of one chance. But no, when there's that much chaos coming, you can't even sort it out, right? Oh. So, um, so I think that, and then, um, you know, but yes, like Adam has always been at a certain proximity to very famous people and conducted whatever work he's doing, whether we are totally wrong and it's just only ever been what it was, appeared, what it outwardly appeared to be, or that there's something else going on, his work exists at a certain proximity to incredibly famous, incredibly powerful people. Whether they deserve that level of power based on their fame is another, and as a society, we have got to reckon with our collective obsession with celebrity and power because that's totally how we've ended up in this controlled space. As for Kanye, so he's both incredibly controllable and also like uh, probably very, very resistant to control. Now, all I'm pretty sure he's a project kid watching him. Because I was just about to say, whenever he goes off the reservation, he ends up at Cedar Sinai, right? And so we all know about that kind of stuff, right? And so there is that. Um, but as far as what you said about Joe, so Joe letting, so my guess would be that maybe part of the agreement to go on the show with Joe was that he be allowed to speak, speak freely for a period of time. And then at a period of time, he'll, they'll, like, he's open to being grilled a little bit or pressed a little bit. That was, yeah. Let me I feel like there were a couple things like on the checklist that he had to agree to. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think one was the Twitter thing. I think two, there was a moment where they both agreed that it was impossible to control Bernie. They both said that really straight out. And he didn't mention he didn't mention Trump. So I feel like those were parameters that were agreed upon beforehand. That's certainly possible. Like, so they're, they're, they're ridiculous, right? But they're, that's certainly possible. But I think most of it was like that there'd be two hours where like there'd be a question answered or something and you let him do his full thing. And then there can be more like, like a style of interview agreed on. Um, and then, and again, I, I may have a completely different assessment of this after I watch it. 
but it's so hard for me to get things watched these days that I'm offering this intuitive. This, this one's worth it because it's not, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Like I, I'm, I would fucking vote for Kanye <laughs> at yeah. this moment. <laughs> I, I, I want to go on a couple of other things though. His comment about Twitter, like that may be his experience. Maybe he has the least amount of his stuff censored there. Totally. Or, maybe that's the truth maybe we don't realize how censorious some of these now he probably doesn't know about like the little more you know less popular ones or the more sort of anarchist or libertarian social media platforms he may just know the ones that are as famous as he is so maybe maybe facebook and a few of these other things are instagram like are really censorious just in a different way and for as to his experience Right. right. Well, when I first heard it, it sounded absurd given what just happened a week ago with the New York Post and Biden laptop. But by the end of the interview, I thought, I don't think he knows about that. So I, 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 it's, it, it felt innocent by the end. You may, may not know about it, or this interview could have been recorded earlier than we thought. So it could have happened before that on a certain level, right? It could have been pre recorded, which is what we don't know. We don't know, right? So, um, so, and then the other thing is, is like, like imagine how terrifying that is if Twitter is the le least censorious platform, right? So that actually could be quite terrifying. Like he could, it's possible he didn't say it, like maybe they're, right? Like who knows, right? But like if somebody think it, if that, let's just say that's the truth and that all these platforms that we, that are even more censorious than we think they are, right? Because we haven't had that direct experience or our favorite content creators haven't been booted off of them. So that's kind of terrifying. Um, then as to your thing about the pharmaceutical industry, like why would Joe be like, we're trying to think of deep reasons aside from just that he's like a shill for like mainstream accepted reality. He has a nootropics company that he doesn't promote on his show anymore. So he's obviously trying to not have everybody constantly know that he's involved in on it as he was back in the beginning. Mm -hmm. As people begin to reject, both reject like the regular pharmaceutical industry, right? Um, those same- Oh, he's gonna put out his own vaccine. The same, <laughs> well, the same pharmaceutical companies are gonna start moving into the realm of nootropics because those are more widely accepted and probably can be manipulated to do a lot of the same stuff that the chemicals can be, right? Like by com combining them with certain things, by, right? Like who the fuck knows? Like making a synthetic version, who the, who the fuck knows, right? But no matter, like at a certain point, the pharmaceutical uh, industry sees the direction that things are going and that people are becoming more aware again of natural medicine. So they're gonna wanna capture that market too, right? So his was one of the first very well- Not, in, not natural. I know that, but it's a very well-known nootropics company that's very well known and the people who are the, the big big boys that on it joe and aubrey marcus have dubious connections obviously with other things and you know aubrey marcus and his father are you know dubious connect right so all i'm saying is and, and this is what one of the things that people have often talked about when they're worried about like codex alimentarius and and they're being like, are they going to outlaw natural supplements? No, the, the, these big cabal pharmaceutical industries will just try and move in and capture that too. They want both markets. They want the, you know, right? And so this could be some of that, like, you know, this, this I, you know, because he's, I don't, to, to my awareness, this doesn't mean that it's not true. He's not sponsored by any pharmaceutical companies. Uh, obviously not on the books, on but the book. you look at this guy who's devoted, he's an athlete, he's devoted, you know, he's, he has this paleo lifestyle, and the way he's been shilling for pharmaceuticals and for vaccines for the past few years is very obvious, is very egregious, and very short-sighted, and doesn't line up with how he lives his life or how much he knows, so there's a giant disconnect totally. there. Yeah, totally. And his total stands on the fake pandemic. So for, for me, I felt like, and I'm not discounting, it doesn't re ring true for me what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I'm not saying, you know, what the fuck do I know? But the fact that he, when you watch the interview and you see how he lets Kanye run and sprint and dance yeah. and do cartwheels and doesn't say shit, but that was where he felt the need to interrupt his guests and correct him. Mm -hmm. That that is pure pure pharmaceutical shilling. I don't I don't see any other logic for that moment. Yeah. And and just so our audience knows, I just want to be clear. I stopped the video that was at three two two hours 
32 minutes, 28 seconds. And I went to get the transcript to copy it, which is how I normally get it because I wanted to get all the words. And YouTube has no transcript option available for the Joe Rogan Kanye, which they've never done as far as I'm concerned on any, as far as I know on any other video. Yeah, that is weird. My, my, my point is like not saying that he's not chilling for the pharmaceutical industry, but a deep reason that he may have or he may use to make sense of it is that nootropic, is it right? That there may be an in with his nootropic company. Like that's all I'm saying is that he- But then why would he need to change the narrative from the pharmaceutical cabal is trying to keep you in their system to the pharmaceutical cabal is trying to treat you? If I, that were his motivation, why would he need to micromanage Kanye's, Kanye's languaging I to that extent? Nootropics and natural medicines may become pharmaceutical. Like they may be, right? Like they, it may be that these things continue to be available, but only as prescription or only from, right? Or, or like that they become much more patentable and all that various kind of stuff, right? And so then those are the new pharmaceutical industry. See, the pharmaceutical industry is kind and wonderful and friendly. They give you natural stuff, but right? But now, it had, now you have to get permission just like the other stuff and it's there to treat you, not keep you, right? And anything you have to ask permission for is keep. And so that would be why he needs, needs to I'm just, we're going really far sort of out on this here, but all I'm saying is, is that he, it's not like he doesn't have some sort of like um, personal interest financially, even if he's not behind the scenes manipulated by pharmaceuticals at this idea of medicines are good for you, right? I don't buy it, but I really like you and I respect you. <laughs> but go, you go do some research on like the um, like Codex Alimentarius. And I mean, I, I did dove deep into that on Plandemic. I know all about that, and I don't. I'm not of the same perspective as you. I do think they're going to outlaw all of that. I don't think they're going to try to just co-opt it and make it their own. Look what happened when Bayer, aka Monsanto, decided to get into the CBD CBD business. Every one of my friends in the CBD CBD business had their Twitter accounts taken down. Their PayPal they. Bayer attacked anyone who was doing anything CBD that wasn't them. That's so exactly, that, that proves my, that's exactly my point. So they're going to do the same with, I mean, I hear what you're saying and maybe they'll be doing that, but it does, it still does not, I don't buy that that's why Joe clamped down on Kanye's languaging because of some like long-term on it vaccine schedule. I think he's being a thousand percent controlled by big pharma. So I, 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 like, I'm not saying that he's not being a thousand percent controlled by big pharma, but I'm saying part of like really effective controlling of a pe person is letting them believe that they have some sincere interest in what they're saying beyond just the paycheck. That's how like it's able to have some, like there's lots of people out there that just bought that line and sinker without questioning it like you did or like I might when I hear, it, right? Okay, and so there has to be some degree of like a natural heartfelt thing in what a person is saying. This mind control goes deep and also it's entirely possible that I'm crazy and I'm reading way too much into it just based on too many hours looking at too many disparate things and whatnot. But I don't think that natural medicine will ever be outlawed. I think it will be captured, right? It will be captured. So just completely separate from what whether Joe's doing that or why he's doing it. Like, I think that like, at a certain, like, imagine the power in like outlawing it, right? But then later, a year or two after, when people are complaining about they can't get their natural medicines, oh, well, you can get them now, but you're going to get them through Bayer or blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. And people will accept, oh, well, at least I get my natural, or people who don't know any better or whatever, right? Like, whenever there's something to sell, the people are going to want to sell it. They're not going to want to do away with something that they can make money off of. They just want to prevent other people from having control over their own health and from being able to make, you know, little amounts when some when they can patent something and make a bigger amount, right? So I, I think that that's like the possibility of nature being captured as a replacement for people who are no longer buying the synthetic medicine thing is something we have to be concerned about as well, you know? So I didn't mean to take us way off there with that, but that was kind of, that was what was sort of informing my thoughts about that, you know? Yeah, I, no, I that, that makes sense. Like a company. Yeah. No, I think it's relevant and I think you you took us to a good place and I do I hadn't noticed that he had stopped mentioning on it but that is 
I wonder if that had something to do with Spotify because he's, I don't guess he stopped mentioning every, well, I don't know. I'm not listening to him on the podcast anymore. I'm just listening on YouTube. He used to always talk about um, the fleshlight and on it and all of these other things. Or cinematic. I, I'd never heard him talk. That must have been during a period when I wasn't listening. But at a certain point, I stopped hearing any of that stuff. But again, watching on YouTube, you may not. Although, why? Why wouldn't you also promote it on YouTube? Who the fuck knows, right? Like, it's hard to say with all this kind of stuff. Um, but the thing with Kanye also, like, is, you know, he lives in one of the most controlled mind controlled and mind controlling families, right? Uh, in all of nonsense, he lives with you know, Kardashians, right? Like they're under mind control and they're like acting to control the minds of a lot of people, right? Bruce Jenner's part of that family, Kim Kardashian, Robert Kardashian, all the little Jenners running around, including Brody and that, right? They're, they're, they're out, there's a lot of mind control being perpetrated from one cluster there on the hill in Calabasas, right? Um, I mean, literally the amount of people that's mind are controlled just by Kim Kardashian's ass alone is defies logic to me, <laughs> right? But this is the stupid world we live in, right? Yeah, this is a stupid world we live in. And, and what we had touched in on a little bit was the first two hours was me trying not to choke on my own vomit of hearing him brag about how famous he is and how he made Gap's stock market skyrocket and Adidas and he did this and he did that. And then I understood by the time he got to his presidential platform, it wasn't so much a platform where I understood, oh, he understands that we're a fame obsessed culture. And there's an, there's an angle at which I could look at this and see, oh, he gets like, perhaps he's used, it's gonna take that level of fame to snap us into an evolved culture and evolved an evolved um, species, and a lot of his ideas were brilliant and beautiful. Um, but it, it kind of switched it for me because I was so disgusted by the fame thing and the, the celebrity thing, and I kept jotting down notes. And then I got, oh, this might what be what it what it takes to get the sheep on board. I'm gonna have a hard time making it through if there's all that bragging about fame and celebrity. <laughs> But what it did, what it did, because I was so disgusted was when he got, when he finally got to talking about his president, his presidency, I got, oh, he is very effective. I got like the proof of concept mm -hmm. in, cause I don't, I don't know. I don't listen to him. You know, like I'm not tracking his career. I didn't realize. I couldn't tell you one Kanye song. Could you tell me one Kanye song? Hell no, yeah. hell no. Yeah. I don't know anything about him. But what I got was it was all proof of concept and it, it it made me understand this is a very successful person who's incredibly successful in a lot of different realms. And I don't personally, I'm turned off by that kind of bragging and I'm not really into fame, but I understood because when he was talking about how he would be effective as a president, I could get on board because I understood you know, all that he'd done, whereas, I, whereas before I didn't. I will, I will try to make myself watch and I'll report back to you on, on, on what I think uh, of all of this. Um, the only thing I really know about Kanye, other than that he's famous and that he's married to the biggest mind control family that there is and, and whatnot, is that his like mom died in some weird plastic surgery event. Yeah, he mentioned it and he was, I mean, what really struck me is what a genuine sensitive empathic human he clearly is and th the real thing and I feel like this is really the leg up that he has is that he's an incredibly spiritual person and he's you know when he was talking about his mom and that pain that was very humanizing um but it's his spiritual connection to like a higher truth and a higher good that really sets him apart and I think is important to pay attention to all right, well, I will pay attention. I do remember at the time that that thing happened with his mom, like that he was devastated and that there was a lot of reporting on how big of a deal she was in his life and whatnot, and how this really, like he may never be the same after her being gone and all that kind of stuff. That's really the only thing I know about Kanye, other than that Sally really likes him. Um. Yeah, I know, I know even less, I know nothing. All right, so, um, you sent me a little note. I'm sorry, I'm not good at tracking the, the messages. Well, you're doing great. I haven't, um, I haven't had a chance to explore your side of the ice cube issue. Um, okay. So I'm not in a space to, to be able to talk about that right now. 
My own little thing, and this is just that I have actually watched almost no Unity 2020 or Brett, whatever kind of stuff, just because I've been busy. And then some of the things people he's been talking to don't resonate for me. I usually try and watch when there's someone on who I have some like or interest in. So there's that. But I did pop in for somewhere between seven seconds and three minutes, I can't remember, of a, a, a Unity Campfire thing or live stream he was doing with Joe Jorgensen, who is the libertarian um, candidate for president, who obviously does either doesn't understand certain social issues right now or doesn't really understand libertarianism because she says it's important that we be anti-racist, so we must be anti-racist. So she either doesn't understand that anti-racism is really racism, <laughs> that libertarians aren't supposed to tell you you must do anything right so one no. i don't know what that is but she obviously is well enough versed in something that she caught the clip i went in on brett was trying to delphi technique her right he was trying to say so we agree that this and this and that right and she's like no no i don't and she was mad she's like no stop stop i don't agree right yes yes I don't, I don't I don't even know if I have the context for what was being talked about but so far the only two people that I've seen protest against his attempts to um just either roll over a disagreement and pretend it's a disagreement or like disguise the fact that he's very dismayed that they have an op opposing idea to his and so just ramble on about something that whatever Is that what they call gaslighting I'm not sure gaslighting is a little bit different gaslighting is like I mean there, there's definitely crossover, right? But the Delphi technique is about gaining consensus and getting the person that who to not recognize that they actually disagree with you and to, to it's about gaining consensus. Whereas gaslighting is just about really like making a person go crazy because you're, you know, like saying, sto doing things that are intended to stoke them, but not leave them out to prove that you've kind of stoked them kind of thing, right? Like yeah. there's various techniques of gaslighting. It's a little different, but there is crossover and both techniques are used by people who are trying to mind control people, right? Um, but uh, this was like a violent protest. No, I don't agree with you, which what I- What was he trying to strong arm her into? I don't, I can't, I can't, I don't, I didn't get the, like, pres like I came, I stumbled on to her. No, 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 wait a second, right? So I only saw the other side of it. I, I couldn't even really understand it, but he had tried to, to roll her into agreement, which is what Delphi technique and consensus is about. And she was very clear, no, 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 I don't agree. And stop, she was mad. It wasn't like, oh, you misunderstand. He was like, yeah, stop that. I'm catching you, right? The only right. people I've really seen do that uh, kind of thing is Justin Amash and Joe Jorgensen, who are both libertarians, libertarians. right? Or libertarian leaning. I don't know that I would count either of them as pure libertarians in any way. So at least as far as like the people who he's trying to gain consensus of publicly to mind control the public into to consent, it seems that he's having better luck on the quasi progressive side than on the quasi libertarian side, which is kind of- And when we say quasi progressive, do we mean leftists? I haven't seen any people on there that I consider like to consider to be like heartfelt, genuine progressives, right? Because there is such a thing. I know people who are that. Who would be a heartfelt, genuine progressive just so we can have a, a baseline? Like, I'm, I'm trying to, I, it's hard for me to think of one that would be someone that people actually know. Like, I okay. know people personally in my own life, but like, um, I'm trying to think of someone who, uh, okay, like, I'm not going to say that she isn't controlled on any certain level, right? But when, um, when like, somebody like like Jill Stein, right? Like there is a very consistent, if you track her from the beginning of when she became publicly known till her last run for president, there is a consistency to the things that she says are important that don't, aren't in discrepancy with something else that she has said that is right. She's not taking issues that are not green party in nature and trying to say they are so that people will like vote for her. I didn't see her doing a lot of that. Like it's pretty consistent. My belief is, is that she genuinely believes the things that she says, but, right? And that she has been consistent over time and that, right? So I'm not saying that there was no um, tomfoolery or tomfuckery or performative shit or any kind of that stuff like that with her. 
but it's she does she's not this person who's like keep saying things like I see this a lot like you'll see someone like Bill Maher who says things that are obviously non-libertarian and claims to be a libertarian mm -hmm. right I don't see that conflict with her a lot of the people that like are presented as from like the more left-leaning um common sense group of people that he has on there like they don't they just like I haven't heard a lot of the protests of no I don't I don't agree with you I have heard that Jesse Ventura disagreed with him a lot too but I well, didn't see that one um but uh so that's just, but but I just I have no love for Joe Jorgensen I have no love for the Libertarian Party at this point it's been a huge disappointment but I did really enjoy that moment of ah hold it right there <laughs> So I don't know if she is aware of the Delphi technique, but what you just felt trying to be worked on you, Joe, was the Delphi technique. And there is something in your in you that is still in touch with like some version of reality that is wholesome and good and <laughs> and whatnot. And you deal with the protest. So I, well, I, also interesting to note that Brett got uh, deplatformed oh. from Facebook, which gives him so much street cred for his uber edgy Unity 2020 instead of four years of Republican Democrat theater bullshit. Let's sign on for eight years of it. Right. So um, so Brett Weinstein supposedly got deplatformed from Facebook. And I think all this stuff is done to like give him that edge of like, this is really dangerous stuff. Just like this faux Spotify controversy with the employees wanting to censor. Not that I don't believe that there aren't crazy enough people to do it, but the fact that it's being paid the amount of attention it is, is to try and frame the public, give the public the idea that Joe Rog Rogan is very edgy. Like if you like Joe Rogan, you are off the plantation. So anything further than that is just outer space insane, right? So they're trying to make like uh, what Brett is proposing seem very controversial, which it's not. It's just like, it's synthesis. It's, that it's, it's actually something the system would love largely. Um, and um, it also like distracts from the larger, you know, censorious actions. Like, like the, the Facebook is censor censoring people that truly are pushing envelopes, right? But they may not be as famous as Brett Weinstein. So he gets uh, some little blurbs about it in the news and gets to whine about it and gets other people saying, did you see that Brett Weinstein was like, even I was disappointed. Carlin Borisenko made a video about it, right? Now, I don't think anyone should be censored ever, including Brett Weinstein, right? And so I was glad that she was standing up for, for that, but you don't see her standing up for like some really controversial people that are being uh, you know, purged off of these social media sites. She stood up for, she, she made a video about Brett Weinstein. Right. Well, keep in mind, she's still kind of a damn leftist. Like, so, I think it, yeah. I don't think, I don't think this makes her controlled or bought or in on it. It just, it, 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 it were, it's working to fool some people, right? It, I mean, a lot of it is not like just, it's not all everyone's controlled. It's just like, we talk about who we happen to be interested in. Yeah. Just because we don't talk about some people, you know, like it's just. Yeah. But the other thing, tell them what happened though. In after you tell tell them about your little interaction with Brett. <laughs> oh, I mean, it was so it's little a good interaction, but it's hilarious. it was just so little. He, yeah, so he posted about it on Twitter that he was deplatformed, and I said, but it does lend. A, I said exactly what I just said here. I said it does lend a certain street cred to your uh, uber edgy, and I think I put that in quotes, Unity 2020 ticket, fancy that. And he liked it and I was like, oh, I guess the sarcasm wasn't thick enough. Yeah, right, <laughs> you were making fun of him. But like, that's how, like, it, you know, this is, it, it was hilarious. I don't ever get any response, any interaction. You always get at least one sort of response or interaction or whatever. So I love that that, that sort of continued in this sort of little thing. So is there anything else? I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Okay, there were two other things, but I also just want to acknowledge the time. There was my self-defense course. Oh, let's take that to afterwards. Let's do that. Okay, so we'll do that for afterwards. And there was also the octopus documentary that everyone's talking about on Netflix. Okay, so let's go to afterwards with those two things. So thank you everybody for tuning in to words and number 35 and afterwards number there aren't 35 afterwards, but just for the sake of me being able to file things together, it's afterwards number 35. We're going to talk about uh, Danny's self-defense course <laughs> and um, the Octopi documentary. Um, and you can find that at Danny's Patreon, which is just Danny Katz. Mm -hmm. Okay, or my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash off planet media for the bonus segment. We will see you guys next time.
Bye. Bye.